1979, after attending a fireside featuring members of the Osman family, Brian Reedy told his mother he wanted to be a Mormon. The answer was a firm no. As a student at Missouri Baptist College, Brian Reedy wrote his first paper on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The paper was titled Mormonism, Christian Church or Cult. The paper consisted of many criticisms of the church, and from then on, if there was ever an opportunity to study the church, Reedy took it. Reedy says in retrospect that deep down he felt there was something more. He writes, I could walk away from my studies of the restored church, but the church was always lurking there deep down. I remember there were times when I would be reading a book about some bit of church history and my spirit would just soar. This was just amazing, I would say to myself, and then shake my head. There is no way it could be true. But then a funny thing happened. Reedy joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is his story. Brian Reedy was a Southern Baptist minister for 25 years and a pastor for 15 of those years. He received a bachelor's degree in religion from Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. He has a Master of Divinity and a Master of Theology from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am so excited to have Brian Reedy on the line with me today. Brian, welcome. It's good to be with you. I'm excited to have this conversation. So first of all, Brian, my my first question for you is you were not initially raised religious. So could you tell me a little bit about your childhood religious background? We were a, I would say, a Christmas and Easter family. We would go to church on Uh those two days and a, a few other days. I had a fundamental understanding of who Jesus was. And of course, my mother taught me to pray when I was a child, but we really weren't active or involved in any kind of church growing up, really not until I turned about 14 years old did we start getting active in, in at that time, of the Baptist church. Okay. And then you, once you became active in church, you eventually went on to study religion in school. So obviously something shifted between you becoming more active in church to then deciding to to study religion. What led to that? When I was 14 years old, a music director, I used to love to sing when I was a kid, a music director at school invited me to join his church's youth choir. And so I did. And the youth choir began with like a fireside or a devotion with the pastor there. And he challenged us. He said, if you had never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you've never repented of your sins, you need to do that. And one way to begin that process is just to pray to Heavenly Father and ask him to forgive you. Uh, Tell him you're sorry for your sins and, and tell him that you believe that Jesus is his son, that he suffered and died for you, and that you want to follow him. You want to commit your life to him. And I did that just a simple childlike prayer. And my life changed at that moment. Now there were no, there wasn't a, it was not a Damascus road experience. There were no lights or flashes or epiphanies, but my life changed. And it it was like, God really got a hold of my life. And I started attending that church after about a year or so through personal scripture reading and praying, I began to feel that God was calling me to be a minister. I didn't know exactly what, but I just felt he was calling me to be a minister. And I felt he was calling me to prepare to be a minister. So when I graduated from high school, I enrolled at Missouri Baptist was College, now it's university, to begin studying religion. And just as a kind of a crazy thing, the St. Louis Latter-day Saint Temple is built right next door to and on land that used to be owned by Missouri Baptist University. So it's kind of interesting how those things came back to intersect after all these years. 
That is super interesting. It's it's interesting. I wonder, I'm sure there's like a story behind that, but maybe that's a story for another day. But that's really interesting that the school used to own that land. So Brian, tell me this. I know that you growing up, you had this ongoing fascination with what then was called Mormonism with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it sounds like it kind of started with the Osmonds. So can you tell me about that interest and where you think it stemmed from and kind of how it progressed as you grew older? Sure. Well, it did begin with the Osmond family. When I was a kid, which was back in the 1970s, they were very famous and they were very famous Latter-day Saints. As I said, this was before I committed my life to Christ. This is probably when I was about nine or ten. We had a friend of mine, a friend of my mom's actually, that was a member of the church. And she invited me and my mother to attend a fireside being held in St. Louis, which isn't that far from where we lived. And it, that fireside featured the Osmond family, Harmon Killebrew, and Paul H. Dunn. Well, I went to the fireside. I remember we were sitting way back in about halfway back in the cultural hall and listened to the testimonies. And I was just completely enamored by it. And I was sitting on the, in in the car next to my mother on the way home. And I turned to her. I still remember this. And I said, mom, I want to be a Mormon. And she like, we'll talk about that when you get home. And of course, when we got home, the answer was no. So that's the seed that was planted. That was one of the seeds that was was planted there were there were several but the next major one was shortly after I became a Christian after I committed my life to Christ I was around 14 I was listening to Christian radio and they were talking about a new book that had come out that, that was a expose of what the quote unquote Mormon church really believed and a little bell went off in the back of my head I'm like oh I remember those guys and so I went out and I bought the book and it was such a sensationalistic book. It was so written so sensationalistically that it really captured my imagination. And within a couple of months, I would subscribe to every anti-Mormon newsletter I could get my hands on. And so those two things really got me going. A third thing was I only live about three hours south of Nauvoo, Illinois. So my parents took me up there and I, and I really kind of fell in love with the history of the church. And when you live in Illinois, if you study, if you take Illinois history in high school, they have a unit on Nauvoo and the church in Illinois at that time. And so my fascination in the history really took off. So I started reading historical books. I started reading the anti stuff. And I also wrote to the church and asked them for books. And they sent me copies of A Marvelous Work of the Wonder. Of course, they sent me a Book of Mormon. They sent me Jesus the Christ, Articles of Faith books like that that I could read. So I really was trying to understand both sides. But it was those combination of things that ignited what would become a lifelong study of the church, its history and theology. I really didn't understand why I was so fascinated with it. People would ask me, why are you into this? I'm like, well, it's a hobby, I guess. Why do you like to collect stamps? I like to study (laughs) the church. Well, and and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but I think you even wrote your thesis on one man's attempt at explaining the origin of the Book of Mormon and kind of disproving the Book of Mormon. Can you tell me why you chose to do that? That would happen later on when I got to, to graduate school, which Baptists referred to as a seminary. Uh, but even before that, I wrote it. If there was a paper when I was in college or even graduate school, if I could somehow tie it into my study of the church, I wrote about the church. It was just something that fascinated <laughs> me. But my first day at, at graduate school, there was a lecture. They had a faculty lecture. They had a chapel. And the lecture was on the second president or the third president of the school. It was a man named William Whitsitt. And the the lecturer had mentioned that Witsit had written an unpublished biography about Sidney Rigdon. And I'm like, wow, I got to get my hands on that. And that's eventually what became the, the foundation of my thesis. And the intriguing thing about Witsit's perspective 
he lived, in, you know, he was writing this in the late 19th, earliest 20th century. He was the first scholar that actually tried to look at the church from a scholarly perspective, not to try to disprove it. He actually believed Joseph Smith was sincere. He believed Sidney Rigdon was sincere. Uh, obviously, he didn't agree with them, but he believed they were sincere men. And, and he, what he wrote was really the first scholarly attempt to try to understand and explain the origins of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I felt that had some merit. So that's what became uh, my thesis. Okay. And then can you tell us a little bit about what you found as you kind of dug into that for your thesis? Oh, uh, well, again, I was really uh, appreciated Witsit's attempt to try to understand it from a scholarly perspective. Now, during his era of the number one theory for the explanation of the Book of Mormon was something that was known as the Spalding Theory, which that uh, right. Solomon Spalding had in manuscripts that said they even got a hold of it and turned it into the Book of Mormon. So he spent a lot of time discussing that. He spent a lot of time looking at Sidney Rigdon was a, a Church of Christ minister before he became a Latter-day Saint. So he spent a lot of time comparing those. He was one of the first persons that I'm aware of that that uh, try to argue for a South American or Central American context for the Book of Mormon. So it's some really interesting things. Brian, one thing that, that I found interesting was that you say that your attitude toward the church turned from being interested to then becoming kind of a critic of the church. When would you say that that happened and what kind of spurred that? So we're going from interested to critic. Right, correct. That happened pretty much when I got a hold of that book. And so that's when I really started becoming a critic. Again, subscribing to the, all, all the anti, anti-Mormon anti stuff. And so uh, so I guess you could say on, on the one hand, I, I was a, you could fully lump me in the anti-Mormon category for most of my life a critic of the church for most of my life. But I also had a really deep interest in the history because the Nauvoo period happened so close to where I live. So it was a combination of those things. But I became a critic. Uh, it was almost like I couldn't join the church. So I, I wrote a title of them, If You Can't Join Them, Beat Them. And so that was kind of <laughs> my approach, I guess. That's so funny because I literally was going to say that when you were just describing, I was going to say, oh, so it's kind of like the reverse of if you can't beat them, join them. Right. Um, but I I love that. And one thing I love, Brian, is you talk about your own faith and kind of your own faith journey, even prior to joining the church. And you talk about how you had to overcome doubt even just as in the space of being a Christian. And I think sometimes we as Latter-day Saints think that we have like a market on doubt and we think, oh, like we're the only ones that have reason to doubt. But I love that you outline the work that you put in to work through those doubts. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, it started when I was actually just out of my first round of graduate school. I was serving at a church in Kentucky, and there were a number of things that led up to it that I will get into, but I just began just all of a sudden these doubts about my relationship with God started creeping into my mind. And it really it really threw me because before the previous 10, 15 years, I'd never had any doubts. I'd never had any lack of, of faith whatsoever. And all of a sudden, here I am really questioning my faith and really, you know, wondering where I stood with God. You know, it, it was a very difficult time. And quite frankly, uh, the, the peak of it lasted about 10 years. Still to this day, every once in a while, I'll have questions, though, it, it it's they're fleeting and so it's just one of those things where you really have to wrestle with and i think sometimes god allows us to go through those periods because once you emerge from those periods your faith is so much stronger and that's kind of what happened to me once i fought through all that and emerged from that 
my faith was a lot stronger. And my advice to anybody going through that is understand that God isn't going to let you go, that you might have doubts, but God is still going to be there for you. And if you just trust him with whatever you have, the smallest seed of faith that you have, if you trust him with that, he will get you through it and you'll be better off the other side. It's not to say it's going to be easy. I was miserable sometimes. I remember just just crying in prayer at times saying, Lord, you know, what's going on? But in time, the Lord brought me through it, and I think I'm stronger for it on the other side. It's not to say I still don't have doubts. I do. But that what I would refer to as my dark night of the soul has passed, and it passed really shortly before I joined the church, to be quite frank. Yeah. I love that. I love that you say, you know, just bring that little bit of faith that you have and God can work with that. I think that that is so, so true. I also love, Brian, how you talk about how you felt the Spirit guided you in your efforts as a preacher. And I think I love that kind of for the same reason that I love the the comments on doubt, because I think sometimes because we believe the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to be the true church, the restored church of Jesus Christ on the earth, we think, oh, God must not be helping people in other churches. But I personally believe that he absolutely is and that he wants to help anyone who is seeking to draw closer to Jesus Christ. And I say that because I have felt God work in my life through people of other faiths. And so I wondered if you have any thoughts on that about how you believe, you know, that the spirit did guide you in your efforts to be a good preacher. Sure. I felt God calling me to be a pastor. One of the reasons I went through the dark night, one of the things that happened during that was kind of my Jonah experience where I felt God was saying, Brian, I want you to be a pastor. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be a pastor. I'm content doing these other (laughs) things. I was content doing other things. At the time, I was working with youth and music programs within the church uh, involved in that type of ministry. And the Lord started calling me to pastor. And the reason I, he started calling me through my own spirit he would speak to me through scriptures and other people who are ministers would come up to me and said, Hey, Brian, you might want to think about this. I think God might be calling you to be a pastor. I had no desire to be a pastor. I not, did not want to be a pastor. And God's like, okay, I want you to be a pastor. So you can take a ride in the belly of a stinky old fish until you're ready to do what I told you to do. And that was part of that dark night of the soul. Now that did not, the dark night of the soul did not end when I became a pastor. It continued for a few more years, but that was one of the things that got me to say, okay, Lord, if this is what you want me to do. Then I'll do it just out of fine. I'll do it. Now I believed that since God called me to pastor, there is a level of authority in that calling. Now I'm not talking about the Melchizedek or Aaronic priesthood, Baptists make no claims to having any type of those priesthood. I do not believe I held that. But because God called me to be a pastor, I believe he gave me a level a level of authority, little a, uh, to serve and to minister. And I felt his presence at times when I was preaching. I felt the spirit. I would preach a sermon and sometimes people would come up to me afterwards and say, well, I really appreciated what you said and you said this. And I know darn good and well, I never said that. But the Lord was using my voice to communicate something to that person. And that's one of the things that I had to to deal with before joining the church. I felt God calling me to pastor. So I felt that he needed to release me from that calling before I could join the church. And eventually I felt he did. Yeah. So you wrote this. I began reading the post of those who had left the church and noticed that most of the people who left the church didn't become evangelical Christians. They became agnostic or atheist. This was troubling. And I found this super interesting, I think, because 
I have observed this in in my own life, in people that I have loved and cared about. But I love that you say it because you were hoping <laughs> that you could save these members of the church, right? And that they would become evangelical Christians. And so it was troubling to you. Why do you think that is that people who leave the church typically don't become evangelical Christians, but rather become agnostic or atheist? <sighs> That's a tough question, and I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. What I was doing at the at the time, my mindset, there was a, a certain level of, I don't know if it's naivete or or arrogance among groups that are critical of the church, especially evangelical Christian groups that are critical of the church. What they're thinking is, okay, if we can destroy this person's foundation for their faith, they'll become one of us. And that was, and some did, but that wasn't the case in the majority. And when that that happened, when I realized that, hey, there's a lot of people that when they, when they lose their faith, when their faith is destroyed, they don't become a other kind of Christian. Sometimes they lose their faith altogether. And the Lord really spoke to me. And and there's that verse in, in, in Matthew, where Jesus says, if you cause someone to stumble, I'm going to paraphrase it here, if you cause someone to stumble, you're in a world of hurt. So that really, that was one of the moments that kind of shifted my paradigm for the church, if you will. And a verse came to my mind where the Lord's like, okay, Jesus said about 2,000 years ago in the Gospel of John, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And I just felt the spirit tell me, Brian, stop trying to tear down quote unquote Mormonism and just lift up Jesus. And that was a, a turning point in my attitude toward the church. As far as why that happens, that's a good question. I sometimes I think for when, when your culture and your religion are so tightly tied together that you can't separate the two. So when you know you feel like those things have left left you down. You have to jettison everything that's connected to it. That's my theory. I don't want to put my words in anybody's mouth, but I'm that's that's my speculation on that issue. And if I'm wrong, I'll be welcome any correction. Yeah. Well, and I think I think that that is there probably is some truth to that. And regardless, I think I think that it's a neat realization that you had that you know, maybe instead of tearing down the faith of other people, we should just seek to to lift up Jesus. Like you said, I know that at some point, Brian, you were connected with some scholars at BYU and that those scholars began to correspond back and forth with you, specifically one scholar. And I don't know, how do you say his name? Uh, Sean Hopkins. Okay. So Sean Hopkin, you begin corresponding with him and tell me a little bit about that friendship that was built and kind of what you learned as you were, had this, this relationship with, with Sean. Around 2011 is when I started getting serious with the missionaries. And after a few months, I really began to feel that God was calling me to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But I had grown up Southern Baptist, and I had been theologically trained as a Southern Baptist. And there are a few significant theological differences, important, between the two groups. And so I was wondering, okay, how can I maintain some of my core convictions, convictions that I think are important, especially regarding salvation, and become a member of the church. I don't want to come in and and be any type of a fraud or a fake. And so I knew I needed to talk to somebody besides the missionaries who I could dialogue with. So I knew BYU had an interfaith program. So I wrote to Dr. Millett, just as he was the name that I recognized, and he referred me to one of his associates, Dr. Sean Hopkins, and, and Sean agreed to correspond with me. So we had a correspondence for about four years through this process where I could ask theological questions of him and he could bounce and and he helped me process through that. And quite frankly, I'm still processing some of that even to this day. 
You know, I've been a member since 2016. I'm still working through some things. But one of the cool things about it was that Sean, Dr. Hopkins, was the guy that baptized me. So I feel comfortable knowing if he thought my some of my beliefs were outside the parameters of orthodoxy in the in the church, he, he would have told me. And we had those conversations. But he was the one that baptized me. So by him agreeing to do that, I felt like he it was as if he was saying, yes, you might have some different ideas, but those ideas are still within the realm of Latter-day Saint orthodoxy, and you're, you're a person that's fully committed to this belief system. And so that's uh, kind of, Sean really helped me a lot through that. That's really neat. And you wrote something that I really loved. You said, and I think this was in regard to that that correspondence. You said, for the first time, I could see that some, and then you had in parentheses, most, many Latter-day Saints were genuine Christians. Are all Latter-day Saints Christians? No. Are all Baptist Christians? No. Being part of an organization does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is becoming a committed disciple of Jesus Christ. And I just think that statement, Brian, is so powerful and makes, at least for me, when I read it, I was like trying to look inside myself and be like, would would somebody refer to me as a Christian? And I sure hope so. But I think that that's a, a statement that makes people think. You talk about how at some point, the missionaries had been teaching you and eventually they dropped you, quote unquote. And that's something that I think a lot of missionaries, return missionaries listening to this podcast are familiar with that idea of of dropping investigators because they said that you weren't making progress. What would you say to missionaries or to anyone trying to share the gospel about what progress looks like? And, and, also, why that was so hurtful to you? Well, there are two things I would say to missionaries about that. Number one, listen to the Spirit. If you still feel the Spirit, even if your your investigator or whatever language you're using now doesn't meet all the key indicators, if you still feel the Spirit when you're conversing with this person, don't drop them. You might not be able to meet with them every week, but once a month, give them a phone call. If you feel the spirit when you're talking to this person, do not drop them, no matter what progress you may or may not see. Because my problem was I had to get things to align in order to join the church. I had to find a new job, which I was looking for. I needed God to tell me it was okay for me to resign as a Baptist minister, and I needed my wife's consent to, to be baptized. And I had none of those at the time. And for about four or five years, I was in that type of a limbo, and it was very, very frustrating. One of the frustrating parts of it is the missionaries would come to me or a well-meaning member, and they would come up to me and they said, hey, Brian, what you need to do is take a leap of faith. Take a leap of faith. It was on your church. Do all this. And God will work everything out. So I would go, and I would go to the Lord, and I would say, Lord, you want me to resign? And he would say no. So I would go back to the missionary and say, God said no. Well, Brian, you just need to take a leap of faith. Well, God told me no. So that's the second thing is listen to your investigator. If you want to teach agency and you want to teach the right to personal revelation, if an investigator gets personal revelation that contradicts what you think it should be, you better have a really good scriptural reason for not agreeing with him. Listen to him. And the reason it was so hurtful to me is because the missionaries and a couple of members were really the only connection I had to the church. My church services on Sunday morning were the same time as sacrament meeting. So I couldn't go to sacrament meeting. I couldn't go to Sunday school. I could go to activities. I could come to general conference. But as far as worshiping with the saints, I didn't have any opportunities to do that. My only solid connection to the church, the only connection to church teaching that I had, other than general conference, was the missionaries. 
And when they left, it's like kinking up a water hose. You just, you or an oxygen tank. You just feel completely alone. And if it weren't for a couple of members, uh, Brother Lynn Ennis and Brother Don Debris, I would have lost all contact with the church. And it wasn't that I wasn't trying to progress. It was just I couldn't get past these points because once the Lord worked those things out, I took the leap of faith and everything worked out. But if I would have done it earlier when the missionaries were pressuring me to do it, I w- it would have been a horrible mess. So listen to your investigator. Listen to the spirit. Yeah. Well, I think you make a couple of really important points there, Brian. I think one, you know, the, even just the verbiage of dr- being dropped feels kind of harsh. And I think that it's important that whatever that looks like, that it's done delicately. And like you said, you know, maybe you can't visit as often as you had been visiting, but don't give up on that person entirely because it's hurtful to anybody to feel like they're being given up on. And I also love what you said about, you know, if it were not for several members, and I think even if the missionaries are not able to keep visiting, they need to make sure that there are other people in place to be a support and to continue to work with that person. And so I I love that. And I appreciate you being honest and sharing those things. So you said that eventually things did work out and were able to move forward. So can you tell us a little bit about what ultimately led you to be baptized as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Well, a couple, there were... A several events, moments that took place. I'll try to just hit a couple highlights. I had made and failed three baptismal appointments. And I was really getting to the point. I had been studying with the missionaries for about four or five years at this point, intently studying, not bashing, but studying with the intent of moving forward. And I couldn't understand why I wasn't making any progress. And then it was the October 2015 General Conference. Elder Von Keech of 70 told the story about the sharks and Australia. And most of your listeners have probably heard it. It was a wonderful story. He, He talked about the reason some things don't happen the way we think they should is because there are unseen dangers. There are, there are dangers that are lurking out there that you you don't know about. And that just kind of hit me between the eyes of the two by four. And it, the Lord just was his way of saying, hey, I'm working things out. Things aren't quite ready yet, but just, just trust me. There's stuff going on back there that you don't know about. Trust me. So I'm like, okay, Lord. And I had peace. And it was almost as if I needed to learn that lesson. Because the very next Saturday, as I was preaching, I felt the Lord in very strong terms telling me that I needed to resign. Well, at that point, my wife was completely opposed to me resigning, at least so I thought. So about a week later, I did a lot of praying and fasting. And I had a conversation with my wife and told her what I felt. And she said, well, I could have saved you a week of praying and fasting. Two weeks ago, God told me you were going to resign. And it would be okay. So there you go. So I resigned. I stayed on through Christmas. I started attending the church. And at that point, everything had fallen into place except for baptism. My wife was had a piece about me resigning from the church, resigning from the pastorate, but she was not ready for me to be baptized yet. And it would take another six months until June of 2016 where she finally said, if you feel this is what God wants you to do, I won't stop you. And so th- that's the abbreviated version of how all that came to be. Well, I think it's such a it's such a great story. And I love your wife's role in it and her saying, I could have saved you a week of praying and fasting. Brian, your wife is still not a member of the church. Is that right? That is correct. 
And so I wondered, because I imagine that there are a good number of people that listen to this podcast that either their their spouse is not a member of the church or their spouse is an inactive member of the church and may be facing kind of differences in beliefs. What has that been like in your marriage and how do you make that work? It has been a struggle, to be honest with you. My wife was very gracious in allowing me and giving me permission, because that's the thing, the, the missionaries wouldn't baptize me without her assent. And she did that. Based, she exercised her faith and did that. Having said that, she wasn't very happy that I felt that God was calling me to do that. So there has been some strain there, but she's been able to get uh, uh, involved in another congregation. And so she takes the kids to that for the most part. My old son eventually joined the church. He joined a couple of years ago, so he goes with me. But the rest of the family goes to uh, another church. One of my sons still goes to the Baptist church we used to pastor. So my, as, as the leader of the family, if you will, my concern is that everybody's going to church and following Christ. That's, that's the key. And I respect that that's what she's doing. And we've kind of, I guess, boiled down to a an amicable ceasefire on the issue of my being a Latter-day Saint. She still has some concerns about that. Stop and think about that. For, for the first 20 years of our marriage, you know, I believe that the Latter-day Saints were wrong and that they were all going to, to hell. And, and that's what I believed and that's what I said. So even though it was a process of five years, it was a bit of a shock for her to have to go through all that and to see me go through that. So right now I'd say we're kind of, I respect her views. She respects mine. She's happy at the congregation that she's ministering in. And so that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Well, and I love, I love that, you know, you mentioned respect. And I think that that is so huge in a marriage you know, even even when you belong to the same faith community, I think that there can be differences of belief and showing that mutual respect and recognizing that we're all on our individual journeys to become closer to Jesus Christ. I think that is crucial and so, so important. And so, I appreciate you sharing that experience. Before I get to my last question, Brian, I just wondered if you could share with us why you are grateful that you joined the church and how the gospel of Jesus Christ has blessed your life. I'm grateful that I joined the church because it just feels like it's where I was meant to be. You know, I studied the church for so many years, not understanding why I went to school to become a ba- I mean, it, the Baptist pastor. It just feels like I am home. It feels, I, you know, for most of my life, once I was a Baptist, I never, ever thought I would be anything besides a Southern Baptist. I thought I would spend my whole life because that's the community that was formative to me in my faith. but. And I still have a lot of respect. I still have a lot of friends. I still have a great deal of love for Southern Baptists, and especially the schools that I went to and the friends that I have there. A lot of love and respect. But when I joined the church, I just felt like this is where you're supposed to be. This is this is home. And just like a, a weight was lifted off my shoulders when I did that. And living the gospel is in my mind, about developing your relationship with Christ, following Christ. And so I've seen my relationship with Christ deepen significantly going through this process and as I've become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I actually, I lied. I do have one more question that I just would love to get your thoughts on if you're up for it. Sure. I think people will, people will look at your story and they'll be like, wow, here's this person that was dead set on being 
a critic of the church, of, of drawing people away from the church. And it reminds me a little bit of Alma the Younger. And obviously Alma the Younger saw an angel and that's what changed his heart. For you, what would you say changed your heart and made you turn toward the church rather than turn away from it and even try to draw people away from it? I would say there were two things. The first thing was was that paradigm shift when the Lord said, stop trying to to tear down Mormonism and start lifting up Jesus. That was a major shift. And the second thing was, it just wouldn't leave me alone. It just would not leave me alone. You know, starting as a high school kid all the way through adulthood, I would just have this fascination with the church. And I would go for a few months and just really pour myself into it. And then I could put it on a shelf for a bit. And then it, something would happen. It would keep crossing my path again. Just like like the temple being built on Baptist land, like going to chapel and hearing a story about when you have with it or learning these other things or missionaries coming, it just wouldn't leave me alone. And I'm like, okay, Lord, why can't I stop? Why can't I put this on the shelf? I spent more time studying LDS history and theology than I did Baptist history and theology. It was just, just a, such some, an all consuming passion for me to study these things. And finally I, I tried getting involved in, anti-Mormon groups I thought I, maybe I could go out and become a pastor in Utah and none of that panned out. And finally, it just got to the point where, I was, where, well, the reason it won't leave me alone is because this is where you need to be. It's kind of a an act of surrender. Yeah. Uh, well, Brian, I am so appreciative to you for sharing your story. And I just have one last question for you. And that is, what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? For me, it means to be a committed follower of Jesus. When I was still a pastor, I would have missionaries come over and they would, we would bash most of the time before I got serious. And one time somebody asked me, well, Brother Reedy, what, are, what, if, what if, if we're right and you're wrong? And I'm like, well, here's the thing, guys. When I was 14 years old, I made a commitment. I repented of my sins. I still repent. But I repented of my sins and made a faith commitment to Jesus Christ. I promised to follow him and do my best to follow him. And though I have failed him many times, he has never failed me. If God wants me, if Jesus wants me to become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he'll get me there. If he don't, I won't. So I'm not worried about who's right or who's wrong at this point. My concern is following Jesus, becoming a committed follower of Jesus Christ. and. You can you can be the nicest person in the world. You can do all these wonderful things. But deep down inside, if you're not trying to follow Jesus, you're missing the, the big the first part of the gospel is faith and then repentance. That is the foundation of the gospel. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, if you've never repented, you're missing the foundation of the gospel. And in my mind, that is what it means to be all in. Well, thank you so much. It's been a treat to talk with you. Likewise, I really appreciate the opportunity. We are so grateful to Brian Reedy for joining us on today's episode. And as always, we express thanks to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for his help with this episode. We will be back again next week with another great interview. But until then, we hope you have a great week. Thank you for listening. <laughs>